to do that. Let me say that again. If you have a social media account, if you have an, a website, or make a public proclamation, a declaration on a daily basis, in a public square around where you live, amongst your community, make that proclamation on what your body count is on a daily basis. So on your social media profile, I want you to state truthfully your body count. And 99% of women will not accept that invitation. The reason is not because the world shames women and their sexuality. The reason is because intrinsically a woman understands that a higher body count means that she has been devaluing herself at a young age. And therefore, she's telling the world that I am a used car, I'm a leased car, and you can still lease me. Now, here's another thing. You can drive. Sit down with your father, your priest, your rabbi, um, your teacher, and tell him or her what your body count is. Tell your parents. Profess your body count. Use a microphone if you want to. And here is perhaps one other litmus test. Get together amongst women, women that you do not know, as friends. See, friends are those who know everything about you and still like you. They take the good with the bad. Get yourself around in the midst of a few women of different age groups, preferably um, 18 and above, adults. I make no specific judgment on specific age within the adult category, any age group and announce your body count and watch as the other women look at you. Women think that men shame them based on their body counts. That is not true. Men fall short in shaming tactics and shaming language compared to women. Women shame other women much more so than men shame women. Why? Because in the dating marketplace, which is where 80% of men are, we don't really care. We just want sex. And we want sex. And we hope you will give us sex. And for nothing in exchange. On the other hand, other women judge women who are loose very, very harshly. There are certain terms that are used to describe women in that category. It begins with S. Sometimes it begins with H. Sometimes it becomes, begins with P. Women are the ones who label other women, especially when there is a disagreement. Meet two women who are friends. One has a high body count, the other doesn't. The day they get into a disagreement, a verbal altercation, it won't be too long before the, the second girl with the lower body count shames the first girl with higher body count and calls her names. Why? Because intrinsically, despite how irritating my words may sound to a woman, there is something deep down in you, in your core, in your being, that tells you that your body count really matters. Now, the one thing I haven't done is I haven't gone into biology. Biology is important. Like as I said, biology puts restrictions, costs, constraints, consequences on women. And those constraints and those consequences cannot be, I guess, excluded from the decision-making process. Biology plays a role in our lives, in your life, in my life. Um, as a man, every single day, without limitation and without restriction, on average, 
I have the opportunity to create new life. Or a woman, you only have the ability to create new life once every year, or should I say once every nine months. The time it takes you to bring life to term is a constraint placed upon you, the woman. And therefore, biology says and nature says, your value is too important. You are more valuable than a man is from the position of being able to reproduce. And therefore, you must maintain control, respect, protect, preserve your value and choose who you allow the opportunity to procreate with. Now, the one thing I haven't said so far is the technologies that we have found um, over the last 70 years have been profound on every single level. Um, one of those technologies that has made the deregulation of the sexual marketplace possible is the pill. There is much to be said about the pill. Now, most women certainly will find it unnerving to hear a man talk about the pill. I can understand that position. And um, my intention, like I said at the start, is not to offend. Uh, my intention is to educate and to advise. Now, there is something I would like to share, and this is not from me, hence me wanting to, I guess, get my system all loaded up. One of the most competent doctors, and a female doctor, said that the pill is a very dangerous medicine. If a woman is thinking about childbirth, she says, the pill has to be stopped six months before the baby is born, or ideally six months before you start trying to conceive. She says that the pill, the birth control pill, reduces micronutrients. Actually, it induces, forgive me, um, and this is obviously um, as not being a doctor, it induces micronutrient deficiencies. It's carcinogenic, and it's immunosuppressive. Now this has come from a doctor. Any doctor who hears what I've just said, I'll be surprised if they disagreed with that. She says it's a very, very dangerous medicine. It induces nutrient deficiencies in a woman. It's carcinogenic and it's immunosuppressive. Now this should not come as a surprise. What this simply means is there are, there are negative unintended consequences of using the pill. Women who are very sexually active have to use the pill to ensure that the, the risk of pregnancy is minimized. But what that intention and the effect of that decision is that you, you expose yourself to the risk of being immunosuppressed, especially if you do it for a long time, if you start too early. You expo expose yourself to being nutrient deficient and you expose yourself to risks that you could be carcinogenic in your long-term um, outcomes from a biological and physical standpoint. So the reason for this is not to say that you shouldn't leave a life you like it's not to say you shouldn't lead whatever life you choose for the future it's to simply say that there are consequences modern western women today have been done a poor and have been done a disservice of not being informed that choices come with costs constraints and consequences and at the core of your choices is a trade-off. Being promiscuous sexually is not a solution to a desire you have. There are no solutions. 
there are only trade-offs. And understanding how to play the short-term game against the long-term consequences is very important. The more a higher body count you have, the higher the probability that long-term relationships and successful relationships will be minimal. Um, there are statistics that have shown this, where there is an inverse relationship between your body count and happiness in marriage or in a committed relationship. And this should not come as a surprise. For example, as a man, we are not supposed to have high body counts. Let me make that very, very clear. Despite the whole thing about our value is created by our actions, it doesn't mean that we then have the authority and the moral justification to go out and sleep with many women. Which is why for men, I personally believe in enforced monogamy, not by someone enforcing it, but from a societal perspective, meaning um, it's in my best interest to say to a young boy when he comes to me, I say to him, listen, between the age of 18 and 23, just focus on school, get the best grades, study hard. At 23, you've graduated, you have 10 years, sorry, five years to get 10,000 hours of great practice, improvements, self-development, learning, stay focused, get to 30, achieve your dreams, achieve your goals, financial, understand your purpose, become a man. And here's the key thing. At 30, you've come to the position of knowing what it means to be a man. At 35, you're ready to be a man. But more importantly, you're ready for the responsibilities and the costs and the trade-offs and the constraints and the consequences of your sexual pursuits going awry. At 18, you might be horny, you might have sex. If something goes wrong, you become a father. Your future, your dreams, your goals, your purpose usually goes down the drain. All for what? A few minutes of ejaculation. Now, I'm not making a moral position here. I'm simply saying you have to think from the position of risk asymmetry. The younger you are as a man and the younger you are as a woman, the higher the risks. The asymmetry is skewed in a negative direction as you have sex. As you increase that sexual exposure, your asymmetry increases on a risk-adjusted basis. The older the man is, the more educated and established, the more you've achieved your purpose and your goals and your dreams, the more you're able to contain that asymmetry of risk because you can afford. You're emotionally mature, you're financially stable, you're physically a man, uh, you're mentally intelligent, you understand your perspectives of life, you understand how to think, you have friends around you, you've built something of yourself. And therefore, you can go into the sexual marketplace and you can accept what the marketplace offers back to you as part of the consequences of your decision. So I do not support high body count for women for the same reasons that I do not accept high body count for men. The standards apply to both sexes. It really does. The point is, men have to create their value. A third of men in Great Britain and in modern societies in the West have been reported to be sexually inactive, many of them being incels or virgins. The reason? They haven't created any value. And the women who are supposed to be in the same age group as they are do not find them attractive. Why? Because they have nothing to offer. Now, I don't feel bad for those men because I don't think young men in any way should be having sex, casual sex. But consequences are too high. But make it, let me make it very clear. The fact that they have created nothing of value does not mean that they are not valuable as individuals, as people. It just comes down to the proverb that says, 
that to everything there is a season and to every season there is a time. Your time will come as a man when you can express your sexuality. Too young, too early, you might have unintended consequences that are far limiting for your future. As a woman, it's important to preserve your man. Go against the grain, be a contrarian. Um, don't spread your legs for the next man that comes professing riches and fortune and travel and fame and happiness and experiences and fun and orgasms. Don't fall for that. Your body is a temple, something you should take very good care of, but you only get one body. Now let me conclude today's session by using what I think is a useful analogy. I started today's session with the analogy of cars. I'm going to end with the analogy of a car. Let's say it was roughly two hours before you were born. And let's assume you were a wise embryo. And the genie came to you just before you were born and said, Janie and James, both of you are about to be born into a world. You've been protected in this womb, but you're about to be born into a world. And I have a proposal for you. The proposal is as follows. From the day you were born until the day you die, you would only get one car that you can use for the rest of your life. The way you maintain, manage, and look after that car will be up to you. But you can choose whatever car you wish. There are no limits. If you want a vintage car, you can have it. If you want a new modern car, you can have it. You can have whatever you want, but once you've chosen that car, you never get to replace the car. And you're responsible for cleaning, you're responsible for washing, checking the oils, changing the brake pads, through maybe a professional. You're responsible for ensuring the car stays very attractive, continues to function. You only get one car, what would you choose? Now I know Janie and James, irrespective of their preferences, will recognize the magnitude of that position they've been placed in. Now, irrespective of what they choose, I believe both parties will say, knowing fully well that I only get one car, I'm going to choose a car that I like, I will choose a car that I can maintain, I will choose a car that I can study the manual to understand how it functions, I will choose a car knowing fully well that I have responsibilities to preserve its value. Because a car's value depreciates with age, time, and use. And when that car is given to you, I know that both parties will do their utmost best to preserve its value. Now think about that analogy and recognize that the car is the same as your body and my body. We only get one body. Yes, I understand the opportunity to do fillers, BDLs, to do surgery. That all the enhancements that we are able to do thanks to technology can augment our bodies, but we only get one body. We don't get to trade up or trade down. We get one. It's important, irrespective of you being a man that has to create his value, or you being a woman that is gifted a physical value. It's important that you preserve the value you've been given, you've been gifted. And more importantly, it's important to realize that the car in question, you paid nothing for. It was a gift. The body you have, you paid nothing for. People are paying surgeons 
people in cosmetic industries a fortune to enhance a tiny portion of their bodies. So the body you have is a gift. My hope and my wish is that irrespective of the choices you make, just before you make those choices, understand that there will be costs, there will be constraints, there will be consequences, and ultimately you will have to make a trade-off against those choices. Now with all of that, who am I to tell you what your body count should be? This one life is your life to each their own.